it's all right with everyone, I think maybe we'll get started. Um, I, we don't have a quorum, so we're going to skip uh, the volume off. We need to skip voting on the uh, prior minutes from January 8th, 2021 and February 22nd, 2001. Although I would like um, the committee to note that back in January, we asked the Department of Agriculture for some more information about requiring a noxious weed employee. And I, I'm assuming that everyone got the answers. So you might look at the January minutes to get a feel for that. And thank you everyone that is here in person and everyone on WebEx. We're glad to have everybody. Is there anything we need to do before we move on to the agenda other than were, were these um, authority for proposed rules and regulations sent via email as well because then any of our WebEx people won't have it. Madam Chair, uh, the proposed rules and regulations are available on the JCAR website on the KLRD. Uh, via the LID, I will send out the link quickly. Okay. Thank you very much, Jill. I appreciate it. All right, then why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, rules and regulations and the hearing, notice of hearing by the Real Estate Appraisal Board. And that must be seen. Introduce yourself, please, for everyone when you get here. You might have to take off your mask to talk in the, because they're so poor. Good morning, my name is Sally Pritchett. I'm director of the Kansas Real Estate Appraisal Board. Thank you. And I am here this morning to address the committee on any questions or concerns you may have with our proposed amendments to KAR 1178-3. Are there any questions or comments? <laughs> Representative Wagner. Can you, Can you uh, basically explain it just, apparently you're just changing from 2018, 2019 to 2020, 2021 edition? I mean, exactly. I, am, I apologize. I haven't done this for years. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's something we have to do. We have oversight by the federal government and uniform standards are what appraisers. It's kind of like they're what they follow when doing appraisals. And currently... The foundation, the one who, who makes the changes to that uniform standards, updated every two years. So it's a matter we just have to update the most current edition. Thank you. Very I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments for Sally today? Should we let her off the hot seat? <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate the information. I appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Doug Jorgensen, our Kansas State Fire Marshal, with some regulations. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Um, I appear before you today to go over and review the rules and regulations that we're proposing for the commercial industrial hemp processing program in the state. Um, we were given the responsibility at the end of last session by a budget proviso. So we started working on these rules and regs in July. Um, and then we have worked with uh, division of budget, department of administration and the attorney general's office on getting both temporary and permanent rules and regs move forward. 
We currently have temporary rules and regs that were approved by the state rules and regs board. They are in place as of February the 1st. Uh, the reason we had to do that is, is that Department of Agriculture's oversight ended the last day of January. And if we weren't able to have the temporary rules and regs in place, the current processors would have had to close their doors and shut down for a period of time. So we did, I think, try and get the temporary rules and regs through as soon as we can. And now we're working on the permanent rules and regs. Okay. Um, for the committee's information too, that during the temporary rules and regs process, we did not have a lot of contact with the actual industry members because of the time restraints. And we were advised by the AG's office to try and get the temporary rules and regs through first and then have that contact and discussion with the industry folk as we worked on the permanent rules and regs. So that what, that's what we've done. We've had one meeting with the most of the processors in the state. There's about eight or 10 processors currently still in operation in the state. They've shared with us their concerns with the rules and regs. They also shared those concerns during testimony on the actual bill um, within the last week or so. Um, we actually worked with Department of Ag and, uh, and local law enforcement entities and we've introduced a couple of amendments to the actual bill that's in front of the legislature right now. Um, the industry had a concern on not being able to transport and sell an intermediate substance, which contains THC, but it contains a THC quantity above the legal three-tenths of a percent that's in the current statute. And we um, all worked on that amendment, and that amendment was approved by the committee. So I think going forward, we've sort of taken care of that stumbling block and the processors will be able to sell and transport that intermediate substance, even though it has a higher THC content than the three-tenths of a percent. Um, going forward, um, some of these current rules and regs, the permanent ones we're proposing, um, we don't see any changes to, but some of these we are going to be making changes to in the future um, before and during the public hearing, which is scheduled for May 11th. Um, and some of these changes are being done um, in our conversations with the industry. Um, we realize that some of these things don't actually fit the Kansas um, industry for processing right now. So we're going to be making changes and they will actually be more lenient in our first proposal. And, uh, and I will, I guess, start on 2226-1, which is just the definitions, rule and reg. Um, right now, we don't foresee any changes in that. So I would present that to the committee as it is. Um, would I stand for questions after each one or do you wanna wait till I'm done? Oh, that'd be good. Okay, is there any question or comment after this, the definition 2226-1? Madam Chair? Yes. Yes, it's Representative Newland. And it's Representative. If I may, uh, before we get too far along then, <clears throat> when uh, Mr. Jordan, you said that you can transport higher levels of THC than what is uh, legally acceptable. Am I correct on that? Um, that is the amendment that was added to the bill that's currently in the legislative process. Um, the current processors in the state, when they process the hemp into basically like an oil, we call it an intermediate substance or a dissolute. That oil is then sold to another processor 
who then processes that maybe into like CBD oil. But that dissolute or intermediate substance contains <clears throat> anywhere from one to 3% THC. And under the current state laws and under the rules and regulations, those processors would not be allowed to sell or transport that dissolute or intermediate substance because of the high THC content. So um, the committee, the um, Senate Ag Committee um, was hearing the bill. We worked with Department of Ag, um, the, law, the state law enforcement agencies, and then also the Sheriff and Chiefs Association and we all agree to some, a balloon amendment and language that will consider that product still in process and part of the ongoing process and allow that to be transported above the three tenths of a percent. Because if not, um, one of the processors mentioned that they would have a five gallon bucket of product at maybe 3% and they'd have to dilute that basically with ethanol and turn that one gallon or that one five gallon bucket in the 10 five gallon buckets. And then they'd have to pay the extra cost for transportation. And the processors in that next step aren't interested in that diluted product. And they'd have a hard time finding a place to sell it so that it could be processed in the CBD oils and other things like that. So uh, again, even the KBI was on board with that change, so we just think it helps the the industry and the state going forward. Okay, if I may follow up on question, please. Yes, of course. Go ahead. So then, this may or may not be interstate. It may be interstate. <clears throat> It is both. There's no restriction on whether it's in or out of state transportation. On the out of state transportation, that depends on the state laws and federal laws that are in place governing the THC quantity. Okay. Well, thanks very much for your explanation. Okay. Representative Wagner. Um, yeah. The, the the bill you made reference that's currently in the House. Do you know what that what the bill number is of that? Uh, 2244. 2244. Okay. Don't don't quote me on that. But okay, so it actually had passed the House, went to the Senate, was in a Senate committee, the Ag Committee, and that's where the amendment was added. And I think it will probably go to the Senate floor maybe next week. All right. Are there any other questions at this point? I know I have one, but. I want to make sure I give everybody else a chance. You made some comment that these rules don't necessarily apply to Kansas processors. Why would there be a difference? What is the difference? No, th these these rules and regulations do apply to the Kansas processors. No, I know. You said there were some things in this that you would have to take out after you got the, the regulations in yes. because they wouldn't necessarily apply to the Kansas processors that was when we started this process we reached out to other states that are already dealing with industrial hemp and we did use some of their current rules and regulations um, to again get these in place so that we can keep the doors of the current processors open but some of those states have different laws so some of those rules and regulations we did adopt in the temporary side really don't pertain to Kansas because our statutes are different. Some of these states have completely legalized marijuana. Others have not, and they're even more restrictive on the industrial hemp program. So we're adjusting these rules and regs as we go forward based on what we're finding here in the state because the current program has been in operation for about two years under Department of Ag. So we're sort of learning as we go. Twenty-six 
or 22262 deals with the registration of hemp processors and renewal of their licenses. Um, I think it's fairly straightforward. Um, the one thing I will bring to the committee's attention is on page two, down on small i in parentheses, um, it currently states April of 2021, and we will be changing that to June, and that will match the current changes that are being made to the statute. Um, we felt it better to run this program on the state fiscal year, and uh, it'll just help us with our accounting, with the permitting and everything else. So we'll be making that change uh, from April to June. And that will be the only change that I foresee in um, 22262. All right, are there any questions? Mr. Representative Wagner. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, you, you, it's April 1st, 2021 currently. It'll go to June 30th, 2021, not correct? Right. June 30th, okay. Just It'll coincide with the state's fiscal year. Okay, are there any other questions? I don't see anyone. You can go continue, please. Um, KR 2226-3, compliance with laws, denial, revocation, uh, and registration appeals. Um, basically, again, I feel very, that it's very straightforward. Uh, it's very short and uh, just, again, sort of follows some of the existing statutes going forward and what we're requiring. Since the processors deal with a controlled substance, the THC, um, we feel it's important that um, those people in the industry don't have criminal history. So we will be requiring criminal history checks. A lot of the processors have already submitted their fingerprint cards to us, and we're in the process of running those background checks with the KBI. Um, and it just sets out how that's to be done. And then um, if we find any um, criminal history or any criminal history pops up, uh, while they're an employee, it sort of sets the guidelines on how we'll deal with it or handle it. Yes, Senator Fausto. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, um, so when you speak of their criminal history as it relates to possible usage or sellage, selling of um, whatever percentage you said here. Um, so is that lifetime or are you going back? I mean, because we, we do look at, um, you know, if, if they've not had any charges for like five or 10 years. So was there any stipulation on that? And I, I think that should be considered, Madam Chair. I'm looking real quick um, to see if that is in here. And if it's not, that is a miss on our point because we did not intend it to be lifetime um, because we're well aware of people being able to turn their lives around. And, um, and I am open to suggestions from the committee on what they think a reasonable time limit might be on that and from the legislature. Um, I, I would think five years would be reasonable, but uh, again, I'm open to suggestions um, actually on second page on number nine it does we did put 10 years in but if you think that's if the legislature and committee think that's too long that's something that we will look at and would be open to revising yes continue uh, madam chair thank you so um, i know that in uh, another committee uh, whereas we're wanting people to get back to work and uh, allowing uh, for that. And I, I thought we looked at five years just to be consistent of trying to help would be my recommendation. But um, thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Senator. I, maybe you could get back to us about what you found of what the standard time period is and then get back to the committee so that uh, the Senator could get her answers. I would appreciate that. Um, if um, I could, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I will note that in that uh, paragraph 10, there's also a uh, provision that has um, that look back period being the preceding five years, depending on which um, thing that you are a, um, applying for. Okay, thank you very much, Jenna. I appreciate that. Uh, All right, would you like to continue? Um, KR 22-26-4, this um, rule and reg is still at the AG's office. Uh, we're still working with their logic department to refine this. This adopts um, all the national standards and codes that we would use to regulate the processor's facilities. Um, the AG's office has asked us to refine this down to the degree that you'll see that we're adopting chapter six, chapter 13, but they're actually having us go into each chapter and delete what parts of the chapter that we wouldn't use for the hemp program so that it's very specific just for the hemp program in the state. So we're working on that with them now, and we hope within the next couple of weeks to have a final approved version of number four from the AG's office. Once they do that, it'll have to go back to budget for budget's approval, and then it'll have to go back to the of A for their approval. So it might take a few weeks to get that done, yeah. And I'm assuming we'll get those when you get them from- Yes, as soon as they're available, we'll send them to the committee. All right. Could I briefly ask you to pause, only because we currently have a quorum and if somebody leaves, we won't have a quorum. And so I wanna make sure that we vote on the minutes before we lose our quorum, and then we'll come back to you, Mr. Jorgensen. Um, <laughs> just never know. Uh, I do have a question. Can we just approve them together or do we need to do them individually? Are there any changes or corrections to the January 8th, 2021 minutes? See anyone on WebEx? If not- Madam Chair? Yes. Yes, this is Representative Newland. Yes, uh, Representative. It may, um, it's a little picky and all, but I was not on the committee on the January 8th meeting, but I was, on the latter meeting. So I, I don't know how you want to handle it from there. Hmm. You want to put your microphone on so that people know? <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, generally we have approved the minutes uh, no matter whether the member had been on or not. I don't, uh, I've never had a committee that did not approve a set of minutes with new members assigned. Okay. So if it's all right with you, um, Representative, we will count you in on the vote. How about that? Are you uncomfortable? That's fine. I that? have reviewed the minutes, and so I would be happy to do so. All right. Madam Chair. Yes, Senator. This is Senator Tyson. Um, he always has the option to pass also. It's true. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. This is Senator McGinn. Yes. So I see that I was absent and I wasn't even on the committee yet. So I don't have a problem voting one way or another. It's just that it has that I was absent and I wasn't even officially appointed to the committee at that time. Were, uh, uh, Senator, were you not on the committee the two years before? I was, but when the president came out with the appointments, I wasn't on it. And so oh. he changed that in, uh, I believe, late February. So another senator was on in place of me. Oh, okay. 
So another senator was appointed in place of me, and then that changed in February. Okay. Well, then we need to. Yes, Senator Bascudo. And and Madam Chair, I thought I was on, but I was on by um, over the phone <laughs> that day. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, they have you. Um, That's we have you present on January 8th. Those are, I think, the... That's, well, that's interesting. Okay, then I'm good. You're, Thank you're, you. You're, you're right there. I can see you. All right. Um, and I'll take a vote. All those in favor Madam, of... Madam Chair, could I interrupt? Oh, sorry. That's right. Sorry. Oh. Representative Carmichael, may I interrupt for just a moment? Yes, sir. Thank Please do. Thank you. Thank you. I would suggest then that with respect to the January 8th uh, minutes that we delete the name of Senator McGinn as being a member who was absent. I would not want, her, want one of her constituents to read these someday and think that she was not attending to her duty. So I would suggest that we definitely amend that to strike her name. I don't think it's important that we figure out who was technically on the committee. Uh, but I, I certainly wouldn't want it to reflect poorly on the senator's attendance record. Thank you. Good point. Thank you very much. Yes. Then I, following up on what Representative Carmichael said, I I would move that we uh, approve the minutes from January eighth with the correction of deleting Senator Carolyn McGinn's name uh, as an absent member. Okay. We have a motion on the floor from. Uh, Representative Wagner, I almost made you a senator. Could I get a second? I'll second, second it. I think, we, thank you, um, Senator Fauscado, with your second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, no? All those who are against that? Motion passes. Uh, the January 8th minutes are approved. With the correction, um, we'll move to the February 22nd meeting. Are there any changes or corrections to that? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Carmichael. Uh, yes, Representative Carmichael. Um, I didn't listen carefully, once again. Um, I don't want to center him again to be shown as absent if she wasn't on the committee, and I, I can't remember whether she was or wasn't at that point, but I note the same is noted on the February 22 minutes. But they fixed it, John. Wonderful. We're all set. Is that correct? All right. Then do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chairman, I make a motion that we uh, accept the minutes as written from February 22nd, 2021. Motion has been, been made by Representative Wagner. And do I have a second? Yes, Senator Bauskado. That And this is what I was referring to, February 22nd. I thought I joined by, by phone on that day. No? Yeah, that's fine. We can move you to... Okay. Being in the so, we, would you like to amend your motion? Yeah, um, that we uh, take uh, the name of Senator uh, Letha Falskado and put under members present, and that would be the only correction to the uh, February twenty second minutes. And do I have a second to the correction in the motion? Second by uh, Senator Falskado. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Okay, we have approved our minutes and with special thanks to the fire marshal for putting up with us. I appreciate that. We'll get back to where we were with you. Um, and you may continue. We left off in KR 22-26-4 again, which is at the AG's office and we're still working with their logic department on that one. But as the chair requested, as soon as we have an approved copy from them, we will get it to the committee. All right, thank you. Ma Madam Chair. Yes, Representative uh, Carmichael. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen, since uh, 22-26-4 hasn't been before the committee, I take it that you will come back to the committee 
and uh, uh, present that new regulation for our consideration once it's uh, obtained the necessary approvals. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And actually, there will be some of these current uh, permanent regs that are before the committee will be probably be coming back with changes to advise the committee on on those too. That that would please me greatly. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Fire Marshal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Representative Wagner. Um, you know, th thank you for your uh, indulgence here. I, I did want to, uh, as the senator had mentioned on the 22263 on the question of the um, drug convictions and how many years going back, it, it does seem to me that what you have in on the page number seven, it says any conviction. Um, and then when you get to nine, it's it's um, it seems to be a somewhat um, perhaps different definition. I and then 10, you know, different things seem to be that they're being talked with. I, I guess my, my concern is just I know in the House as well, there's on this sort of criminal justice reform. I, I, I know that's also being talked. I, is there a matching Senate bill? Is that what you're OK? But 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 just that that, that it is very clear about because number seven particularly mentions marijuana, you know, that it's just clear that if somebody has a past conviction for marijuana from five years or whatever ago, um, you know that that it's it's clear what what the time frame for that is. Uh, that's my only comment. Um, thank you. And I made a note for that for that because seven is set the way it is because again the processors deal with THC and with marijuana, so we were concerned about anybody with a past marijuana conviction being involved in that. But we will look at. Um, possibly putting that five-year limitation that's been suggested on all those convictions, and that'll probably just make things simpler for everybody. All right. Madam Chair. Anything else? Yes, yes, Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Carmichael. Thank you. Uh, I can also, though, appreciate why uh, in adopting regulations and even in our own statutory activities that we might want to treat people differently who have a past history of violating the law related to marijuana and THC uh, than other types of convictions. And so I can appreciate there might be a reason that in some circumstances, well, I won't try to say, but I, I understand why it may be not, why it might be a good idea to treat people with drug uh, marijuana convictions uh, differently than other types of convictions. So I just wanted to note that and say, I, I can understand uh, why the fire marshal's office might view those differently than other types of convictions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Representative Carmichael. Is there anything else? I'm not very good at looking at hands up, so if our IT would help me <laughs> to say that someone has their hand up, that would be wonderful. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to five. 22, five, policies five. and procedure manuals. That's um, in the actual statute and another rules and regs. One of the things we require when they submit an application is we are going to require uh, sort of a procedures manual on how they operate, what type of process they have and how they do that. Because we're finding that right now we have probably four or five different types of processors in the state. So that up front lets us know what type of operation they have, whether they're using CO2 for the extraction or ethanol, or whether they're not even doing an extraction process. All they're doing is drying the hemp. They're possibly grinding it into a powder for the powder to be used somewhere. There's one processor that grinds it, turns it into pellets. Then they ship those pellets to another facility that they have and they turn that into more of a powder or something that can be used in, a, in, a, in another product. So um, this just gives us an upfront idea of the type of operation that they're, they're running. Um, and it gives them an idea of what we're looking for in that procedures manual. And I don't see any changes uh, going forward on it. And nothing that... The industry, anyway, hasn't brought up any concerns with this particular KAR. 
Representative Carmichael, you have a question? I do, Madam Chair. Um, and I can certainly understand why it's a good idea perhaps to have some description such as what Fire Marshal suggests. Um, has there been any consideration or given or has the industry expressed any concern about whether or not these policy and procedure manuals might disclose confidential or proprietary trade secrets or information which might put one at competitive disadvantage to another? Because my guess is, and, and maybe not, but my guess is that these policy and procedure manuals uh, to the extent that they end up at the fire marshal's office might be subject to Kansas Open Records Act, or do, does the fire marshal even intend that these manuals be provided to the fire marshal's office, or is it just a matter they're available in each place of business for inspection? Just can you help me understand how this is going to work? I can, sir. Um... Our intent is for these manuals to be submitted to their office when they submit their actual application for license. Um, the None of the industry so far have had an issue or concern with that because the current processors in the state are doing the same type of processing that's done all across the country. It's just different types, and they have not expressed a concern to us yet about it being proprietary information. And I don't think I have any concern in that regard either. I wanted to inquire, and that seems to be a satisfactory answer. I appreciate that. All right. Representative Newland, you have a question. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, sir, if you would answer, it kind of follows my earlier question, that these processors would be having a product that we would be transporting then either well, probably interstate because it is an illegal product in this state. I'm hanging on a minute because the chair just stepped out. So that's fine. Thank you. the assistant's telephone ringing. Um, I asked him to turn it down, please. If, if I could, could I ask you to repeat your question? Absolutely. It kind of a follow-up on my earlier question, because this raises uh, a suspect in my mind that these processors will be allowed to ship an illegal product interstate. Uh, because that, for some place to get rid of it, I guess, in, in other words. That actually is currently happening, which we have found out. Um, under current state law, they cannot ship, transport, or sell anything that contains more than three tenths of a percent THC. And that was one, of, again, one of the issues that they had. Um, it would cost them a lot of additional expense business wise, both in diluting the product, uh, the amount of product they would have to pay the ship, and they contend that there aren't other processors out there that are interested in having to deal with a diluted product when they can get full strength product from another place. So again, depending on what happens with the current bill that's in the legislature and what the legislature does with that, it could stay at the three tenths of a percent. Um, and or it could go above that. Um, and again, it just depends on what happens with the current bill. And we will follow the guidelines of whatever the bill sets out and whatever the legislature's direction is on that. Thank you. Okay, just for your, your so you don't have to turn sideways, the camera's looking straight at you. So when you respond, I know it's odd to turn, you want to talk to the person that's speaking to you, but they can, you're, you don't have to worry about turning to the video screens. Moving on to KAR 22266, that's processing records. 
Uh, we did, we have received feedback from a lot of the processors that they think these current um, records that we're asking for and how it needs to be done is overbearing. Um, they have proposed a different way of doing it that's easier for them and still meets, I think, the expectations we have. Um, so we will be probably resubmitting 22266 in the future with different language based on our conversations and also the other state agencies and local law enforcement involved really don't have an issue with us changing this one either. All right, are there any questions on this part? And we'll see that obviously again at another hearing, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, 22267, access the property. Uh, we don't an anticipate any of the changes with this and we're comfortable with the current language that's in it. And we've had no negative feedback from the industry on it. All right. Continue, please. 2226 facilities exceptions. Uh, again, no negative feedback from the industry. Uh, and we're comfortable with the language that's in it, and we plan to move forward with it as it's written. All right. Any questions or comments on this section? Not. Continue. Uh, 2226 9. Uh, the only feedback we receive from the industry and what we're looking at changing is on page two under small h number one, we will reduce the amount of recording storage from 90 days to 30. Um, the processors did share with us that going to 90 days, a lot of them already have closed circuit security systems in their facilities, but it would add a fairly large expense to upgrade to a DVR that would handle that 90 days and be retrievable. And, and we're fine with 30. So that, that change will be coming forward at a later date. Yes, uh, Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Fire Marshal, um, first, I understand actually that you have now had some meetings with folks, uh, with processors from the industry, is that correct? Yes, sir, we have. And I, and I appreciate that effort on the fire marshal's office because as you might recall, I expressed some concerns at the uh, Temporary Rules and Regulations Board about that interaction. And I, I do wanna express my appreciation to you for reaching out to some of those folks and listening to their concerns. Um, I have likewise heard concerns uh, about the 90 day requirement and in fact, some of the overall video requirement. And when I look at your financial impact statement, I don't, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see a description of the cost to business, the affected business, the processors of this particular regulation whether it's 30 days or 90 days, is that contained in your financial impact statement, what the estimated cost of this particular regulation will be under either 30 or 90 days? No, sir, I don't believe it was specifically in there and listed, I don't believe we individually listed all of the expenses that we perceived. Um, we were just operating under the fact that um, we just had to make sure that it wasn't to a certain or above a certain limit. And if that's well, not yeah, the you, case, you then had, that's... You, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, and if that's not the case, that's our fault. But again, operating with our conversations with the vision of budget, we were unaware that we had to specifically list out all the expenses that we thought the industry might incur um, with the rules and regs. Well, I do recognize that you have a conclusory, conclusory statement in your financial impact statement that says you don't expect the cost of these uh, regulations uh, to the industry are in excess of $3 million, but I don't have any way to evaluate that without some data of some kind. And I thought at least that the statute required you to make some good faith estimates uh, based on 
conversations with the industry and your other sources so that the committee has a genuine opportunity to reach a conclusion as to whether uh, the cumulative cost does or does not exceed the statutory limits. It, is there any kind of a breakdown where we could go look and see this regulation or cumulatively all of these regulations, how much they are going to cost the industry other than just a conclusory statement that you don't have to have any more hearings? No, um, there is not a current breakdown, but if the committee wishes, um, we will put one together that we can distribute back to the committee um, because in our conversations with the industry, this was the only issue they brought up so far as best I can remember on additional cost. But I'll review those um, notes from the committee. Um, we actually put an advisory committee together and mm -hmm. I will send another email out to that group and I'll ask them if hey, they have any additional concerns cost wise over the rules and regs and I will get that to the committee for your information. Well, and I greatly appreciate your cooperation in that regard, Mr. Fire Marshal. Um, I will tell you that in my conversations with processors, I think there are some other regulations that are proposed today that have probably more may impose an even higher financial burden on the industry, but we will discuss those in due course as we come to them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Wagner. Um, yes, I, I think Representative Carmichael's question is well-founded, but I I think the answer to it, I'm looking in our information packet on the next, the final two pages under F, uh, where they talk about an estimate as to the total annual implementation and compliance cost. Um, I mean, there is some, some somewhat, some detail provided there and at the top of the next page where it says, give a detailed statement of the data and methodology used in estimating the above cost estimate. Uh, I mean, the only cost they're applying here frankly, are just the renewal fees. Uh, they're not really taking into account any of the um, surveillance costs or such. But I, from this, I think that somewhat answers your question. Am, am I missing something, Representative? Yeah. Madam Chair, with your permission, I, I interpret this differently. Um, I think that <laughs> this is there's more than just what the total implement, pardon me, implementation cost is. And I think there's some obligation to tell us how much this is going to cost the industry uh, so that we can determine whether or not it exceeds $3 million. And so, Re Representative, I'm not quite following. Maybe you could direct me a little once again to the portion of this packet that you were referring to so that I can re-review it. If, if you don't mind, where were you at again? Yeah, no. Um, in the printout, it's it's like the very last two pages. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a section F. I mean, it, again, it, it's not very detailed. I mean, I you know, but but I presume this is where the fire marshal would put that information when when he gets around to collecting it. Yeah, I agree with you that that's where the information belongs. I, I think when we adopted the new statute regarding uh, financial impact statements, part of what we were really trying to do was to find out from administrative agencies, not only what the cost to the agency was, uh, and not only what the amount of their licensing fees would be, but also the estimated implementation costs uh, of, uh, of the regulation. Because what we found was, just adding up how much a $25 fee was or a $100 fee was really didn't reflect the true administrative cost and burden of a regulation to industry. And so perhaps we have a difference of not you and I, but perhaps there's a conceptual difference as to whether or not it's sufficient to just put in an impact statement, how much the fees are going to total, how much it's going to cost the industry and then say, but it's all gonna be less than $3 million to industry and then avoid the financial impact uh, hearing process that we put in the law. So, you know, this is sort of a discussion and I don't want to delay the fire marshal today uh, with any more comment on my part because I know he has many responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative. 
I have a problem with this as well. Um, just even quick um, calculations. Um, I had no idea there was such a publication such as Marijuana Growers Daily. But it mentioned that uh, it can be about eighty dollars to $100,000 for any normal um, operation to put in some of the security equipment. So you said we have about 12, or you said now you're saying eight? Um, there were 12 in the ag, but I've reached out to each one individually. A couple of those have gone out of business, and we've received applications from about eight. So currently, based on the applications we received, we only have about eight processors right now in the state. And again, there are varying degrees of processing going on. Well, and that begs the question, what kind of decommissioning work had had has to be done when you when someone says they're now out of business? Well, Is anyone checking to see if they've taken care of everything? Or, uh, you know, it's kind of disconcerting that you have had 12 and now you have only eight. And that would have to be a question for ag because, again, we just sort of became involved officially February 1. So that is something that we will look at going forward because we have um, tasked our fire investigators who have full law enforcement authority to do part of this process. And they will be the ones that will go in and verify the records on the amount of hemp they're seizing, or excuse me, that they're, that's coming in from the growers. And then they'll be reviewing the records on whatever product is um, produced and then we also were going to require that the containers that any intermediate substance is in or anything that contains THC is sealed with evidence tape and that when it's transported it has a seal on transport that where it's going that seals then broken and they have to take pictures and document that uh, again just so we have a good chain of custody on a controlled substance and we will as um, individual processors go out of business or don't renew, we will pay them a visit and make sure that they are shut down because we're finding processors currently in operation that ag didn't know about. So um, as this goes on, um, we're sort of all learning from it, but um, we will not allow a processor to sort of close or go out of business without verifying that. Well, that does, but that is a, that is something that I looked into, and I think that should be those uh, outside of the checking on verifying the people that are in business and not that we need to be adding the the security measures to your economic impact statement because this is far more wide reaching than it appears to be. I will reach out to all the processors and I'll ask them for a list of what their anticipated costs are under the current um, regulations minus probably the 90 day, 30 day storage. And, and I'll share that with the committee. All right, I would appreciate that. Are there any other questions? Yes, Senator Goodell. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so you mentioned, you said um, they would have to uh, verify or look into who's who's they who who are you referring to that to make sure a processor actually is out of business yes ma'am that would be our office and it would be our our fire investigators would be doing that are there any other questions if not go ahead um 10. Um, acquisition of hemp byproducts, intermediate substances, or seeds. Um, this basically states that hemp byproducts, substances, seeds um, can only be transferred between processors that have valid licenses. Um, it gives some of the guidelines on the record keeping that's going to be required. Um, and we will be making a change down under 3C um, 
there was some concern from the processors about the devitalization of the seeds within 10 days. Uh, initially, the 10 days is too short of a time frame in their process to accomplish, but then they also say they have a market for those seeds. So we are adding language in C that would state that each processor that acquires seeds containing THC that are not devitalized shall devitalize those seeds. And we're going to probably extend that 10 days to 30 days. Uh, but in that time, they also have to take appropriate security measures to make sure the seeds cannot be diverted. And the reason we're putting the THC explanation in there is, is that some of the processors contend they have seeds that do not contain THC. And we will do, be doing periodic testing. And if they have seeds that do not contain THC, we're not interested in regulating that. And they can sell those or use those however they see fit. Continue, Senator. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. So if you could just tell me real quick, what's the percentage of the THC that you would be looking for? Well, right now, um, nothing can contain more than three-tenths of a percent in, in seeds and stuff. The only exception to that will be if the current bill goes forward with the amendment that would allow a higher content than that and just the intermediate substance. But anything besides that intermediate substance cannot be more than three-tenths of a percent. Yes, uh, Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Fire Marshal, in fact, that was one of the other concerns that has been expressed to me by folks in the uh, industry, uh, was this matter of not only the time period to devitalize seeds, but also the ability to market seeds that do not contain THC. And again, I appreciate you uh, listening to the uh, business's concerns in that regard, and I look forward to seeing a, a revised regulation. And thank you for giving attention to their concerns. All right, thank you. Let me go ahead. AR 2226.11, inventory control. And I think I mentioned at the beginning, we did receive feedback from the industry and they feel that um, these are a little overbearing for their current procedures. And they have given us a recommendation more of doing it on a batch process. So um, as we continue to visit with them, we probably will be changing um, 2611 um, to fit their processes a little bit better and not make it so cumbersome on them on keeping records. Are there any questions or comments? I know I have one. Is anyone else? Representative Carmichael. Thank you. And again, this is another area where the industry had expressed some concern to me, uh, and I appreciate you listening to them. Uh, in, in addition to the batch processing, and I'm not sure if it's this reg or maybe it's a little farther down, uh, but there was also concern about the daily inventory reports. And can you tell us what's contemplated there? Or if, in fact, we need these daily inventory reports, uh, why? And what are you going to do with them? Are you going to have somebody, you know, a half FTE that every day reviews daily inventory reports? How's that going to work? That actually is in this KAR, and it's down under 9B where we were asking for in a report at the end of each working day. I see it now, yes, thank you. And that's one of the things we're gonna work with the industry on. Um, again, because that might be a little overbearing, um, but again, um, we've actually scheduled tours next week of three of the different processors. So we're actually going out to um, Clearwater, to Wichita, uh, we're going to Larnard and Great Bend, and then we're going to a facility in Douglas County. And they all do different types of processing. So we're going to actually see up front just how they operate and get a better idea on how we can work with them to adjust these inventory, inventory control reports. And, and folks in the industry have already expressed their appreciation to me 
uh, of your willingness to come out and see them and try to work with them. So again, I thank you for, for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there any other questions, comments? Representative Wagner. I just have one comment. I, I'm on House, Fed, and State, and of course they're looking at this medical marijuana um, proposal. And I, I know one thing about it, there's some like seed seed to source, you know, tracking or something. It's like an RFIB little deal with it or something. Are, are you familiar at all with any of the proposals on that as far as a method of tracking, um, you know, your substance? Is that ring a bell at all? No, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with that. And that would probably bring an additional cost probably to this. And so... Um, we're comfortable with doing it by paper and with the different type of evidence tape and and secure locks that maybe are neat, used during the transportation. Fair enough. All right. Are there any other questions or comments? I, I do have a, a concern when I read things like this because not I, I believe they should be tracked. However, when you look at the daily reports and you look at the extensive um, reporting requirements that they have, that requires a, a human to input it in a computer or whatever else they're doing in some sort of database. I don't see any mention of adding any employees in the, in the fire marshal's office to start helping with this since you've taken over this. So... I think that needs to be in your economic impact statement as well, because I don't see anything. I think we, if it wasn't in the impact statement, we put it in our um, fiscal note. Um, we are looking right now at two full-time employees and one part. No, I'm sorry. I got confused bills. We, again, because of the low numbers of processors, we don't think that we're going to have to add staff. Um, if the number of processors grows in the future, we might have to then. But right now, with only eight or 10 processors, um, we feel that we can handle it with our current staff. All right. Any other questions? If not, you may go ahead. 222612, disposal of hemp waste. Um, we are working on, um, in the definition section, it actually has the definition of hemp waste. Um, and we're working with the industry because they had some questions on that. But they contend that a lot of their waste contains no THC and that during their process, the THC stays in the distillate or the intermediate substance or is lost. And so again, we'll be doing spot testing and as long as the waste product does not contain any THC, um, they'll be able to dispose of it however they see fit or be able to even sell it because we have some of the processors that say they have a market for the leftover powder from their processing. And so again, as long as it doesn't have THC in it, um, they'll be free depending on food food regulations and Department of Ag regulations, because some of them are wanting to sell it possibly as feed for animals. Some are wanting to sell it as a fertilizer. And those things will have to be dealt with with some of the other state and federal agencies. But we'll have no, um, uh, no oversight on any of the waste as long as it doesn't have THC in it. OK, Senator Fausco. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, how would that law enforce, sir, um, uh, distinguish, determine if it's hemp or marijuana? With, and, and what is this certificate that one would have? And I mean, what, so is there a little test machine? How, how would they, in that transporting, or how would that be? How does that work? Thank you, Madam Chair. Right now, on the testing side, our investigators will have individual one-time use test kits, but we'll also be able to take samples. Um, currently, Department of Ag and the KBI labs do do quantitative testing, but only on floral material. They don't do it on liquids. 
So we're in the process of starting a, a state contract with a outside private lab that can do quantitative testing on liquids. But most of the waste is of a powder or another type of actual substance. We're able to test that almost on the spot. And then we'll also be able to send that to the KBI lab and they'll be able to quantitate it to tell us if it has THC and if it does how much. Um, but again, as long as those tests come back negative on THC, they'll be free to do whatever they want with those waste products. Absolutely. Madam Chair, if I may, just to follow up, but here it says uh, uh, process or transfers must be accompanied by a harvest certificate. What is that? Um, I think, are you in 12 or are you in a different one? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm on 13, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll be my question when we get there. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I would be curious to know how much testing will cost for, for your, your department. And that probably should also go in some of those. We can do that. It'll be intermediate testing. Um, currently, the statute, or excuse me, the bill that's in the legislature um, lets us charge the processors for that testing and for the background checks, but we don't intend to do that. Um, we feel that the $1,000 um, annual license fee is sufficient, and we will pay for the background checks at the KBI that run with the federal side about $45 a individual, and that we will also take care of any testing that we decide we need to do out of their registration fees. Okay. I'd love to see how you, you know, when in like in a fee fund where you see how much you spent of their fees and, and that kind of breakdown, that would be nice to have. We will do that. The current stat or the current bill takes any monies received from the processors, puts it into the fire marshal fee fund, but we will have a separate category or section for that. So we'll be able to track that just on an, just related to the hemp program. All right. Is there any, is there anything else? Let me go ahead. KAR 2226.13 transportation. This just puts in, um, Again, writing some of the requirements on when they transport anything that contains THC. Um, we will, and this is specifically referenced for anything that contains THC. Again, if it doesn't have THC, it doesn't really matter to us what they do with it or how they transport it. So down in C, there might be a change um, because we do use the definition in one of hemp waste, but we're considering of adding THC there just so it's more specific. And everybody knows that the transportation of anything related to the industrial hemp program, um, these, this regulation would only cover things that contain THC. And if THC is absent, there would be no controls. because They're not necessary. And then I think you had a question earlier about what a harvest certificate is. That's actually, that's under Department of Ag's rules and regulations. And when you have a farmer or grower or producer that actually is growing the marijuana, when they harvest it, it has to be weighed and they have to um, have a certificate that accompanies that marijuana to the processor. So one of the things we'll be looking at in our record keeping check is to make sure they have all of those uh, certificates from the growers on file and on hand, and that what they're receiving from the growers somewhat equates to the amount of product that they're that they're coming up with when they finish the processing. All right. Were there any other questions? If not, please continue. Twenty two twenty six fourteen chain of custody transportation. Uh, this just lays out again the evidence tape, the sealing of the vehicle or part of the vehicle that the intermediate substance or any substance that contains THC, how that's being done. And um, 
so far there has been um, no concerns voiced by the industry on these. They realize they're dealing with a controlled substance and um, so far again, they're okay with how we've lined things out for uh, the custody of the products to be handled and taken care of. Are there any questions or comments on this? Once again, it looks like the digital photos will be coming into the fire marshal's office. So I, I'm, is that correct or is that? Yes. So it, it looks like there's going to be quite a bit of time, man hours. So it would be wise to try to figure out if you will need any more FTEs. We, it starts to pile up in my in what I'm reading. And, and it could. Um, again, just on an estimate with, on, again, only eight processors. Um, we currently have two administrative support staff in our investigation division, and we think that they'll be able to handle initially the amount of paperwork and documentation that we might be receiving. Okay. KAR 2226.15, stop sale, use, removal order, cease and desist. If we find issues with a current um, processor or we find a processor that hasn't registered, uh, under current law, we're able to issue cease and desist orders and, and close that facility. Um, and again, um, that removal of the order shall be, or the order shall only be valid for more than seven days. Um, so it gives the facility time to make corrections to the issues that we find. And then we're able to remove that that stop sale or cease and desist and let them continue to operate. And the industry has had no um, negative feedback on this reg. All right, are there any questions or comments on this area of the regulations? Yes, Representative Wagner. Just sort of a, a question. So when these companies go out of business, is there some process that you decertify them or inspect and make sure there's no whatever unaccounted for hemp? Um, does that come into play ever? It hasn't yet, but I think the chair asked sort of the same question earlier, and we will be very diligent on visiting processors that go out of business to make sure that they are shut down, that they're not still continuing the process and just haven't applied for a license. And if they do shut down, um, we'll make sure that any product they have is disposed of properly. It's just one sort of conceptual. The, the eight or 10 processors, I'm kind of envisioning in my head, I mean, these are small businesses, five or 10 employees, or I mean, are, how, how big is this whole processing hemp industry at this point? One of the processors, I think, told us he had seven employees. Other processors are just family operations that only have a couple because it depends on the size and the process they're doing. Um, the actual processors that process into the oil that is then processed in the CBD, I think they have more employees. The processors that are just drying, we have one family that had a large alfalfa dryer that were drying alfalfa in the agriculture industry, and they now use that to dry the marijuana for the farmers, and then they grind it. And that's just a couple people. So it's across the board, depending on how they're doing things. All right, were there any other questions or comments? If not, you may continue. Last one, KAR 2226-16, testing. Um, there is continued discussion going on with the industry on this. And again, I think I previously mentioned that um, they were concerned. They can right now estimate that when a, they have to do a test at an outside lab, it runs them as much as $300. Uh, and again, we can't use the state labs on quantitating liquid, but we can use the state labs on quantitating the floral or uh, plant material. So again, we're in the process of reaching out with um, purchasing and trying to establish a contract with a private lab to do the quantitative testing on the liquids. And again, we 
uh, envision paying for that testing when it happens out of the um, registration fee that the processors are paying each year for their license and not passing that cost on to them. Are there any questions or comments about that? Anyone online? I don't see any. All right. Is there is there any question or comment that you have about the entire presentation? Yes, Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Carmichael. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fire Marshal, I note in the financial impact statement at, uh, I believe, what would be page two of the statement, the reference to KAR 22-26-8 facilities, and it discusses the code footprint uh, an architectural document that shows the facility meets in FPA code requirements, life safeties, including sprinklers, alarms, exits, et cetera. But when I cross reference back to 2226.8, I didn't find the reference to the uh, code footprint. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out where the code footprint requirement, that architectural document is. And then I think I understood that we will be seeing a different or a new regulation relative to application of NFPA to these facilities. Can, can you help me get back on track, Doug? Um, I believe that you'll find the reference to the code footprint in 2226.4 in any of those, in one of those chapters or NFPA editions that we've listed. Um, and I, but I will have to check with staff and make sure on that. Yeah. And, and that's why it's specifically not listed anywhere because yeah. it's included in those um, editions and chapters of the national codes that we plan on adopting. And, and so you understand, we don't get 22-26-4 they don't send those typically to the legislature until they've gone through the approval of the logic process, et cetera. So I don't believe I have 22-26-4. And what's in the financial impact statement is I think a reference to 26-8, which is the exemption, exemption statute, which might allow for processors to apply for exemption from what I presume will be 22 26 4. That's and correct. Um, okay. The, so good. We're, yeah, we're on track then. And I hope you understand why I have my confusion because it refers to the exemption and, and the substantive reg hasn't reached us yet. Um, and I'm sure you're aware, then, uh, though, looking prospectively, you're aware, I'm sure, of concerns expressed by the industry as to potential costs in. in what some see is a, almost a second life safety type code review and perhaps additional addition, uh, perhaps additional architectural drawings and the like. And I'm sure you're going to be working with folks to, to try to guarantee life safety while at the same time uh, minimize the impact on the industry. Is that fair on my part? Yes, sir. And especially in this case, because most of these processors, again, have already been in operation for one or two years and they have their facilities as they are. And we were not involved in the initial process when they started. So we will look at these as existing facilities and they won't be held to the life safety codes as stringent as somebody building a new one. And we will, they have the ability to request a variance from our office on any violations that we do find or things we point out. And um, we're going to address those um, variance requests based on the actual facility itself. We're not going to do a blanket thing on all the facilities because they're all different. And we'll address those um, on a case by case basis. And, and that makes good sense to me. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen, uh, and just, you know, since we're here, um, the concern that was expressed to me by some of processors are they've already been through local code review, they're up and running, and now they're going to have to hire their architect 
to come back and prepare additional architectural uh, code footprint type documents. And that may be necessary. I mean, I, I can anticipate that there might be fire hazards associated with the processing of a, a product like this, not only the, the uh, leafy green botanical product, we used to call it, but also some of the solvents and chemicals. So I'm sure you're gonna use good judgment in, in perfecting uh, 26.4 to lessen the impact to the extent you can and to avoid duplication of expenses that have already been incurred. I assume that's all fair to assume. <laughs> We, we will do our best. In fact, some of the processors already have fire alarm and sprinkler systems in their facilities. So again, right. it's, it's something we'll have to address on a case by case basis with the current processors, but it's those requirements will probably be fairly firm on if anybody wants to come into the business and, and start a new business. Um, but again, uh, until we get out and visit each one, we're, we're just not sure what we're going to find. We have pictures of one operation that was built into a probably 14 by 14 plywood room inside a metal Quonset hut. So we're going to have to look at that differently sure. than a facility that is maybe in a commercial building. So Could I... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, it's again just not to repeat myself, but I am, it's going to be on a case by case basis. Um, could, could I inquire, does NFPA or other uh, national code authorities, do, do they have particularized codes for this hemp processing yet? Or what, what, where, yeah, what guidance do you look to uh, in that regard? I can't hear you. <laughs> we did look at the national standards and in um, 22.26.4, we reference chapter 38 out of the NFPA. And that's a specific chapter just for hemp processing and marijuana processing. So we are based our rules and regs off of that. The other rules and regs, or excuse me, the other chapters and additions of NFPA that are listed are all referenced in chapter 38. So that's why we're having to adopt those two. The chapter okay. is one specific chapter that deals with marijuana or hemp processing. Sounds like I have some more reading to do. Thank you for helping me out. Uh, and that concludes my questions. I, of course, will have comments on the regs, but thank you very much. All right. Someone else, did you say? Representative Newland. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is, uh, in our Ag Committee, uh, during those two years, I was under the understanding there were only about three processors that were actually up and running. Uh, and now I'm finding that there's uh, eight to 10. Uh, are they actually all of them up and running? Or are some of these just applications uh, for a uh, processor. My understanding is in reviewing the records of ag at one time, they had as many as 15 to 20 processors submit applications and were licensed. Um, I again have called everyone that was on the ag list. A couple of those individuals only bought the license in case they thought they wanted to process. In over two years, they have not started a business. Um, there's a couple that have gone out of business. So from the individuals that started in the ag program till now, we're just down to about eight or 10. And we've only received, I think, eight applications so far. And of those eight to 10, are they all uh, in the process of processing or are they just still applications? Uh, they are all currently processing as we speak to different degrees. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any further questions or comments at this time? If not, I wanna thank you for being here um, and uh, answering our questions and I'm sure we'll have other questions and comments to send to you, and we look forward to seeing you 
uh, when you get here for the, the additional rules and regs that you haven't published yet. And, and I guess I have a quick question. Um, we have the public hearing, Secretary of State's office has scheduled the public hearing for May 11th, yeah. and we hope to have all of these permanent regs rewritten and through the state approval process by then. So as these are approved, even if it's one at a time, I'll be sure and send those to the committee so you have them ahead of time. And then I will, I guess, reach out to you, Madam Chair, on, on getting on your schedule as soon as the public hearing's done. Yes, this, this, yes, that would be wonderful. I have just one last question that is sort of general. Why was all of this moved from the Department of Agriculture, which is obviously it is an ag product, over to the fire marshal's office? Um, we were asked, somewhat volunteered by other state agencies, um, actually, the KBI, the AG's office, have been working with the Department of Ag since the beginning. Um, but when it came evident that the program was going to continue and that Ag's research program was uh, discontinuing and it was actually going to be a business and available to anybody that wanted to be in it and not a research program, um, they wanted an agency that had both fire and life safety inspection ability, but also law enforcement authority to oversee the processors because of the involvement of THC. So they came and asked us if we would be interested in helping. And we had a few discussions and meetings and then um, we agreed to take on the responsibility. Okay, thank you very much for that explanation. It kind of didn't quite makes sense to me from the start. So um, I'm glad to have you tell us that. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. I want to thank the committee for your time. I know it was lengthy, but again, very much appreciated. Well, it's some, something serious, so we do need to be looking at it. Thank you very much. Um, then at this time, I would ask the committee, I know we've lost some, uh, for comments or, now you know why I interrupted you, sir. <laughs> so that we had a, a quorum when we had one. We strike while the iron's hot. So are there any questions or comments about the proposed rules and regulations note, uh, for the Real Estate Appraisal Board? Not seeing any. Uh, we'll move on to um, comments for uh, the State Fire Marshal on the new regulations for hemp. Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Carmichael. If I stepped in front of anyone else, I, I didn't mean to. If someone was seeking recognition before me, I apologize. No, you go uh, ahead. I kind of see the condition of the room now. Um, I think the There's first a lot of us in here. I understand. The first comment that I would suggest that we make is that we do express our appreciation to the State Fire Marshal for reaching out to the industry. Uh, he has now held meetings with some folks and he has uh, listened to their input. Uh, and we appreciate his intention uh, to incorporate the concerns that he has learned in revised regulations as well as new regulations that he has already uh, discussed with us. Um, I think it would also be appropriate uh, for us to express to the fire marshal our appreciation for his willingness, uh, along with his staff, uh, to tour some of the existing facilities so as to get a better idea uh, how he can tailor his regulations in a way that performs the necessary regulatory function, yet at the same time uh, lessens the financial impact uh, to the industry. Uh, a third uh, comment or recommendation that I would have is that we do have concerns with the financial impact statement. Um, just a moment here, I got to hang up by somebody who doesn't quite understand that when I'm in a committee hearing, I can't take phone calls. Uh, the third uh, thing that I would suggest is that we, I'm in a committee. Uh, the third thing that I would suggest is 
that we express some concern, however, that the financial impact statement may well be inadequate, uh, that we believe that there needs to be additional specification of what anticipated costs there may be, not only to the agency, but probably more importantly to the uh, industry or the affected business, the processors, and that uh, simply saying it's less than $3 million uh, in implementation costs uh, is not, in our judgment, sufficient, and that we have concerns that the actual implementation costs could well exceed the $3 million limitation, and that our fourth concern is that if there is non-compliance by an agency, whether it's the fire marshal or any other agency, with the law as it relates to the financial impact statement, it could provide a ground. It could provide grounds for uh, individuals uh, charged with violating these regulations. It could provide grounds for them to perhaps invalidate the entire set of regulations because they were not promulgated and adopted in compliance with the law. And that would be particularly concerning with an industry like this, which deals with something that in many people's mind is a controlled substance and one that we would certainly not want to see uh, regulations, in viol uh, uh, important regulations invalidated by the court uh, because there could be significant uh, consequences if products with THC uh, were to uh, were to be distributed or, or or somehow were to gain access to distribution through the hemp law, and, and that that would be a concern of ours. Those are my thoughts, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative. Representative Newland. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just. Uh, make note that I find it troubling that we have a cons controlled substance being transported that is illegal, but we are allowing a legal transport up to another place so that it can be processed. Uh, so we're supporting the transfer of an illegal product. And I have, I have quite a problem with that. So just wanted to note that. Noted. Know that our committee assistant will put that down. That is con your concern. Representative Wagner. Yes, I, I just wanted to uh, second what uh, Representative Carmichael uh, said. I, I thought uh, the comments were very appropriate. Uh, they were lengthy, but they weren't tedious. And so I appreciate that. <laughs> Does, does anyone else have a comment or a concern? Yeah. Madam Chair. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I would certainly presume that our staff will use a uh, Scrivener and editorial license so as to uh, edit down uh, the verbosity, or verbosity of my remarks to ensure that they were not tedious. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm noting that our committee assistant is vigorously shaking his head, no, he will not. So we'll look forward to that on print as well as in person. Um, anyone else? I do agree that, that, that those are good recommendations and I, I appreciate your concern with the controlled su substance being shipped. So I'd like some more legal advice on in that area to see how they work around that problem. Uh, the only other thing I see is that going to the joint rules and regulations uh, site on the legislative website, it's not been updated. So um, if we someone would contact uh, IT and have them update it, it still has Tom Cox on the Representative Cox on the uh, uh, membership set and a lot of things that aren't correct. So if we could get someone to check into that, I'd really appreciate that. All right. Are there any other comments or questions from the committee? If not, I think we're time. it's time to adjourn. Thank you all for being here.